Perfect. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to today's first session. And uh, today we have uh, uh, Sheriff uh, mm -hmm. joining us from Near. He's the head of education at Near Protocol. Um, yeah, Sheriff, uh, this session is going to be about 25 to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, in the first 20 to 25 minutes, we'll, you know, uh, Sheriff will present and, uh, you know, share some activities. Uh, uh, at the last uh, five to 10 minutes, we'll take some questions. Sounds good, Sheriff? That sounds perfect. Yeah. Right, perfect. Thank you. Over to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I think what I'll do is is really just kind of spend a few minutes uh, walking through here, and and, and you know, I've got a couple of slides prepared for you. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you like this. Um, step four is blank because I, I'm not quite sure what we want to do next. So I'll I'll just give you kind of three uh, steps uh, here, and and uh, you know. I, I hope this is interesting for you, this presentation. Uh, we can dive as deeply as you want. Um, I'm, I'm happy to kind of go in, in several different directions. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll try and take about 20 minutes or so, uh, maybe 30 max. So uh, what, what can you do after this? Uh, there's a Figment Learn pathway for NIR. We'll actually pay you $20 in NIR tokens for about 30 minutes of your time to go through and, and try uh, the NIR API and, and work with some of our, our code. Uh, the, these slides I'll share um, uh, after the presentation so you can, you can click on these links if you like. We have a bounties program. Uh, you know, where you can earn near tokens for a few days of work, maybe a month or, or more. We have a grants program. So the bounties are our ideas. The grants are your ideas. That's basically the difference. Um, I mean, not exactly, but but that's a good way to think of them. Uh, and so the grants can be, you know, um, uh, obviously any idea that you want, you want to build something for near, you want to build something new, uh, and we're willing to to reward you with that. We also have the Open Web Collective, which is a, a group of entrepreneurs that last year raised fifteen million dollars uh, for their their startups. Um, and then the Gitcoin Kernel has an eight week fellowship uh, that I have an invitation for. If you you want to join that, there's another one starting shortly. So there's a bunch of things that you can do uh, to, to lean into this uh, once you've, you've learned about Nier. So uh, maybe we could just spend a, a minute talking about where are we. Some of you already know this. Um, normally at this point, room and how much blockchain experience you have. But um, if you'd like, maybe you can just answer me right here in the chat. Uh, if you would, uh, maybe uh, you could use uh, some kind of a scale. Um, Zero for no blockchain, one for like uh, a year or two, and then two for, uh, uh, you know, pro professionally building, you know, something like that. Uh, just to kind of give, give me an idea of who's in the room, um, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of your background. So uh, zero, if you just not really have any, you don't really have any blockchain experience. One, if you've spent a year or two looking at this. Um, and then give me a two if, if you're professionally building on maybe Ethereum or, or some other um, network. Um, that, that would help. So I'll just give that a few seconds here. I've, I've got three responses. Uh, somebody's sending me a direct message. That's fine. Um, if you don't want to make it public, no problem. Um, okay. So, and I, I think I'm, I'm sending to... Um, panelists and attendees. Oh, I see. Okay. So there, there's only a few people in the room. So I think, I think that covers it. <laughs> okay. I, I sent earlier, uh, I sent this, uh, you know, kind of z zero, one, and two. So I don't know if, if Zoom is, is capturing this for the recording or not. Um, but, um, but this way everybody uh, can, can get a, a sense of what I was asking there. Okay, so uh, maybe then you already know this, um, but if you, if you imagine you know, uh, this kind of a, a you know, rainbow of, of layers from you know, 50, 60 years ago, uh, you know, 70 years ago, uh, reaching back from the mid 1940s and 50s, 60s into this decade, um, here are the, the bands of that rainbow. There's this connected web of computers that were the size of houses and then buses and then cars and then desks. And now in your pocket you have, or on your wrist, you have a computer that's always on high speed connected to a worldwide network of other computers. Uh, and, um, and, and you can, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, rely on that computer being connected. You're surprised when it's not connected, if it slows down, if it's not working. Uh, you're annoyed when you have to charge it once a day or sometimes once a week. Uh, and so that, that's the idea of these machines being uh, connected and available and everywhere. 
The readable web is uh, these machines, uh, you know, being originally connected with ARPANET and maybe bulletin board systems in the 80s and 90s to, uh, you know, the, the beginnings of the, the World Wide Web, uh, putting encyclopedias online, Google indexing everything better than many other companies, you know, uh, coming out as the, the winner of the, the data indexing wars, basically. Um, and uh, today, you can read the web through your watch or your phone by asking a robot, hey, Siri, uh, what time is it or what's the weather tomorrow? And Siri will read the web for you and answer your question. Uh, the writable web is, um, you know, the, uh, the creators, the uh, Free Software Foundation, open source software, uh, the development of software and content uh, on these systems, uh, you know, through social web, social media, Clay Shirky, here comes everybody, uh, you know, early uh, 2000s, all the way until today, TikTok, Instagram, you know, I don't know what, you can literally grab your phone and in a moment's notice be live streaming to, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands or maybe millions of viewers uh, with just the click of a button. And then finally, the trusted web, this layer on top of all of these computers that are now everywhere, we expect them to be always on, giving us information, taking information that we can reliably transmit anywhere in the planet at millisecond latency. Uh, the trusted web, starting in the 1970s, maybe with the 1976 paper by Diffie-Hellman, uh, crediting Merkel with this idea of public key exchange, um, that you can keep secrets in public, basically. Uh, that, that's, that's the bit there. Um, uh, Chom and his papers uh, that he wrote through the early 80s, uh, and then I think um, eMoney, uh, hash cash later from Nick Zabo, B money from Wei Dai, and then finally uh, Satoshi and Bitcoin as being blockchain version, uh, you know, one or whatever zero generation, uh, then second generation, uh, you know, blockchain with Ethereum, and now third generation blockchain with all of these layer one smart contract platforms like Near, Solana, Avalanche, Polkadot, Polkadot uh, and, and many others. Uh, this trusted web uh, laying on top of all of these machines now. We we can rely on basically this truth where it's more expensive to lie than it is to just tell the truth. Uh, and because of that, we can trust this layer with things like identity, money, ownership, provenance, you know, where something came from, all of these things. That's what's going on right now. This gives us now access to all sorts of new ideas and new things that we've never had in all of human history, because we've always had to trust banks or kings and queens or governments or, you know, pharaohs. We've had to trust someone else to manage our relationship between people that we didn't know. But now we have this blockchain as the ultimate honest actor that uh, cannot lie because it's too expensive to lie fundamentally. And you, you can test that by just looking outside. Uh, there's 1.5 trillion US dollars worth of value sitting there out in public on the blockchain. Anybody can take it if you can just lie about the truth, if you can just lie about a private key and you know sign a message and transfer that wealth to you. And you can be sure there's a lot of people who are interested, maybe you're interested in getting some of that money. Well, go ahead, do it. It's literally sitting right there in public. Uh, but of course, it's too expensive to lie. We don't have the technology uh, that can allow us to lie uh, about this data. And so because of that, we can start to build decentralized autonomous organizations that manage millions or billions of dollars in capital. And we don't worry about it, actually. Uh, we have multi-sig uh, contracts that uh, make sure that whenever we sign something, only the people that are allowed to sign it can sign it. We can design new kinds of economic communities design. Um, in fact, we might be able to remove banks, border control, and other uh, mechanisms where we're relying on some other, uh, you know, um, uh, kind of um, uh, some other uh, body, a, a bank or a government or some other agency to basically manage the lack of trust that we have uh, with other people by trusting the blockchain. That, that's kind of the, the big idea. And of course, uh, it depends on where you live and how you live as to how relevant this is. But maybe this gives you a sense of kind of the size of the thing that we're talking about right now. It's a pretty big deal. And of course, it's gonna take 10, 20 years, maybe more for any of this to really matter. But we're right at the beginning where we start to see very clearly some experiments happening around the world. And so Bitcoin gives you this cryptographically verifiable transactions, decentralized storage and compute, and a public ledger.
these three ingredients come together to make Bitcoin. Effectively, you can think of Bitcoin, some might say like a clock, where instead of having, uh, you know, uh, time uh, in our uh, watch or time, you know, measured by the sun, we're measuring time in terms of blocks. And these blocks create kind of uh, something that happened before something else. Uh, we can rely on that because it's cryptographically verifiable. Um, it's hard to attack because it's decentralized and it's uh, meaningful to us as a as a, a society because it's public. It's not some secret that a company holds. And so we, we all trust it. And then we have this shared version of time where we can put transactions like I have this thing and I give it to you. In the same way in reality, outside of the digital world, I might give you an orange or an apple and now you have it and I don't. It's impossible for both of us to have it. That double spend problem is solved by this trusted clock that we have. Ethereum is this basically uh, a Bitcoin uh, technology, this blockchain, this decentralized, cryptographically verifiable public ledger with a Turing complete virtual machine. Into this virtual machine, we can run anything. A, a Turing complete machine basically means it's a machine that can simulate any other machine. That's the idea, including itself. Uh, so you could simulate a car or whatever. Uh, and then the inputs are uh, code and data that come off the chain into the machine. And the output, the data that comes out, also goes back in to the blockchain. So uh, that's Bitcoin, that's Ethereum in just a, a couple of words. And then the challenges, of course, is this, it's expensive, you get low throughput, it's hard to scale. And so there are several organizations that are trying to solve this problem. Near by parallelizing transactions in shards, Polkadot by parallelizing transactions in parachains that then kind of scale out in this fractal tree, Solana by time stamping transactions, parallelizing them and then merging them back in the correct order. And then finally, Avalanche by specializing in these chains, maybe a C chain that mimics Ethereum, an X chain for value and a P chain for uh, governance. So everybody's got their own idea about how this might work and we'll see who, uh, who comes out, you know, what the, the winners are, you know, in a, a couple of years from now, basically, but we're all racing as fast as we can to onboard developers, get them building on near, get users on near, because the network effects of uh, these, uh, these platforms uh, is really uh, what's going to determine uh, the winner. Okay, so what is this technology? By the way, if you have any questions at this point, feel free to type them uh, right here in the chat. I can see it. Uh, here and I will notice uh, immediately if you uh, if you type uh, a chat. I'm highly interruptible as well. If you just want to unmute your mic. So what is near? Briefly, uh, it's cheaper, faster, and easier to use. Contracts written in assembly script or Rust doesn't matter, and then they're compiled to WASM. And uh, this is great because from a development perspective, there's lots of JavaScript developers. Maybe you know JavaScript or TypeScript, and so you can pick up assembly script very quickly in a matter of hours, maybe a day or so, becomes very clear how to use it. The Rust tool chain is very mature, and there's a unique account system on near that makes it very easy to think about contracts and application design uh, because it's human friendly. It's like having solid, uh, uh, Ethereum's ENS built into the protocol layer. And we support an unlimited number of, of keys uh, you know, with different permission levels and, and so on. We'll talk a little bit more about this as we go. And then from a production perspective, uh, gas costs are much lower, 100x, maybe 10,000 times cheaper than those of Ethereum. Um, you also earn a third of transaction fees that are burnt, uh, you know, so 70% so gets burnt of transaction fees and the developer earns 30% directly to their contract. Um, and then the uh, system will, will also, uh, although mainnet is only single sharded right now, when we have multiple shards, uh, the, the, the system will uh, have um, uh, you, you know, multiple accounts sort of moving around shards to balance to make sure there's not like one hot shard with a bunch of people trying to get onto it. In fact, you can't control which shard your account lives on. You basically create an account and then near reallocates. Um, and then of course, it's, 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 high, it's highly uh, responsive, you know, one second block time, three second finality. Again, feel free to uh, to ask more questions. Uh, thank you for the compliment, uh, Mariano. Um, I, I've been working on that history for a while now. If, if you think it makes sense, that's great. I'm happy to share with you the resources that I've gone through to, to kind of shape that up. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's all out there. It just doesn't seem to be collected in, in any one place. Um, and Nikhil is asking, what's the advantage of using WASM? Why not have something like EVM? Um, 
Yeah, so uh, in, in fact, uh, we are using a near VM. Um, it's a, um, um, uh, it's a, a virtual machine that runs WASM bytecode. Uh, the, the EVM is a, is a custom virtual machine uh, that runs Solidity bytecode. And so th the question is, you have a choice. Are you going to make a custom virtual machine and write a language for it? Or are you going to use uh, you know, a, a kind of a, 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 a more general virtual machine and use uh, supported language? That, that have other applications like Rust and Assembly Script and potentially others. We, we could certainly write an SDK for C Sharp, C++, Go, any compiled language that has some you know, guarantees of, uh, of you know, performance and safety where you don't need to include uh, an interpreter or something like Ruby would be difficult or you know, Python would be difficult to put into, into WASM for that reason because you would have this massive uh, machinery to interpret uh, along the way. But anything that can be compiled uh, to WASM like this without any of that other overhead uh, would work. And so that opens up a whole world of developers who already know these languages or maybe you want to learn Rust. Uh, and uh, that way uh, you don't need to learn a new specialized language here. Of course, we also benefit from all of the innovation uh, that comes. Happy to share those, Mariano, no problem. Just don't let me forget before we separate. If not, I'll give you my email and we can correspond, DM or something. Uh, and then, and so so uh, lots of tooling, lots of innovation that happens in the Rust community. We benefit from all of that. We don't need to kind of uh, lift Solidity or, or any custom language on our own, basically. Uh, so there are several advantages there, obviously. Um, it does make it a little bit harder because we have to make sure that, uh, you, you know, some of the, the edge cases are handled. And of course, you, you can't do everything that you can do with Rust. For example, there's no concept of time on the blockchain. In fact, because the blockchain redefines its own concept of time, there's no concept of randomness exactly because you don't have access to these kind of random seeds like time or machine hardware or whatever. And so we have to come up with our own kind of sources of randomness on chain. And so some of those limitations make it a little bit different. Near also supports the Ethereum EVM as a contract running on chain. So uh, you can read more about that on our uh, website and in our documentation and, and use it now. It's deployed on Betanet. And I think, uh, you know, before the end of this year, we'll have that running on mainnet. Uh, I think that's the expectation. But actually, you can deploy your Solidity contracts uh, from Ethereum directly onto this EVM that's running inside of Near. if you don't want to rewrite those contracts, for example. So there's, there's also opportunities for that. Okay, hopefully that answers the question. So let's talk about dApps at a high level. And um, I just want to time check. Um, how much time exactly do I have? It's another 20 minutes? Yeah, yeah that, that should be OK. Yeah. OK, nice. So I'll, I'll try and, and keep this, although there's many slides coming up here, I'll try and move through them in about 10 minutes. So it, we talk about a high level on Near. How do you actually build stuff? So basically, you've got your, your DAP, you've got the blockchain layer, and you've got this RPC interface, you know, remote procedure called JSON over HTTP. You're moving JSON packets back and forth. And then we wrap that for you with Near API JS. So from your application, you're just writing JavaScript. And uh, th that's no surprise. Like Ethers JS or Web3 JS, it's the same sort of idea, uh, but you can communicate directly with that RPC API. And, and then, of course, we use exactly the same interface for all of our applications. Examples at near.dev, our Explorer wallet, our command line interface, we use all the same channels there. And so, because we're, we're eating our own dog food, we rely on these same interfaces. You can be sure that we prioritize these the stability, uh, security, and so on of these interfaces. So that's at a very high level. Let's talk about a little bit lower level. So you've got your app, okay? Some idea, you're thinking about it. You're trying to figure out what are you gonna do? And then all of a sudden, you've got an idea. So you write some contracts, maybe using assembly script or Rust. You deploy those contracts to an account that you've created on near protocol. So with Ethereum, your account's automatically created as a hash of your uh, externally owned account and a nonce uh, that generates a new account, not so on near. It's like ENS. You make an account and then you deploy a contract to that account. Uh, you can overwrite that contract if you want to until you remove the full access keys from the account. Then you can't overwrite it. Then you know it's trustless. And so uh, you deploy your code and now your code is on near protocol. So near protocol is actually maybe two pieces you can think of, the blockchain layer and the runtime layer. And so in your app, you're going to use near API.js. We just mentioned that at the high level. You're going to send some 
you know, request a command, send a signed transaction, whatever it is, to the RPC interface that we just discussed a minute ago in the blockchain layer. That's going to hand it off to the runtime layer, spin up a virtual machine, reach into state storage, grab your code and load it into the virtual machine, interact with state storage, maybe reading and writing, and then send the request back. You've got 200 teragas. It's about one teragas per millisecond because we measure in Yocto near 10 to the minus 24. Uh, and so this 200 teragas is about 200 milliseconds worth of time for your function um, to do its work. And then it's got to get back to your application. So that's typically a life cycle. If you're already familiar with blockchain development, this, this shouldn't be a surprise. This is kind of like old news. But if you're new to blockchain development, it's good to get this picture in your head. It's a little bit like a serverless function in some ways. In, in the web world. So if we talk about the storage itself, actually, storage, you can type on the command line near state and then any account name and you'll get the metadata. The metadata will show you, you know, the, the amount that's in the account, both in um, Yocto near 10 to the 24th and formatted as near. This account has 42 near and, you know, 10 cents but it's a much bigger number if you measure it in, in Yocto near. Also, there's a code hash similar to Ethereum. There's a code hash, a fingerprint for the contract byte code, which is unique to that contract. And so assuming deterministic compiles, you're using a Docker virtual machine or something like that to compile your contracts deterministically in a controlled environment, you'll get exactly the same code hash for exactly the same contract source code. And that way you can check to verify that this source code was actually compiled and has been deployed to chain. And then the storage used, there's state storage staking uh, that NIR uses, which charges 10 NIR per megabyte of data or one NIR per 100 kilobyte of data. So this uh, contract, this account is holding 107, 177 kilobytes. So it would be, uh, you know, one near 77 cents would be held in the account because of the data that this account is storing. Uh, if I clear out that data, I can unlock and get back some of those tokens. So one near 77 cents there. Um, the data is stored as key value. It's, it's just um, key value pairs. These happen to be uh, base 64 encoded, but that, that's what the data looks like. And if you actually look at the details there, the contract uh, code is stored in a special keyword uh, called state. Uh, that's the key where the contract code lives, but then you have your own custom key value pairs and you can also use some abstractions that we've given you like persistent vector, persistent set, which behave like you would expect, you know, a vector or an array and a set, which is basically a unique collection. We have testing for assembly script and Rust. You're going to use different SDKs to write these contracts, and the unit tests are different, actually. So in Rust, it's baked into the language using this test macro. In assembly script, we use Aspect. It's a custom library for testing assembly script, but it looks just like RSpec. Um, you then build the contract, and you can simulate t the behavior of the contract, either calling one method at a time from the near VM at the CLI, or if you want to simulate multiple contracts working together, cross-contract calls, asynchronous calls, you know, calling another contract and getting a call back, things like that, then you would use the near SDK SIM to spin up a virtual machine, create these multiple accounts and have them call each other and, and tell you, you know, how much gas did they spend and, you know, what were the results, the outcome of the calls. And then finally, you would deploy to testnet and there you can do some integration testing, you know, with near CLI or with near API JS from your app. Maybe you want to use, uh, you know, something like Mocha testing or something like that directly from your application, how you would normally test a web app. So the, these three kinds of testing are currently supported. And we have several examples of all of this. We can talk about accounts briefly. They have human readable names. I mentioned this before. So here's some accounts from you know mainnet, paywith.near or whatever. And you can have these sub accounts. And I, I don't think there's any limit to how many sub accounts you can have. You would use these sub accounts to kind of you know namespace some of your work. So maybe it's like you know your app.testnet, and then it's like v1.youraapp.testnet, you know, v2.youraapp.testnet, however you you manage these accounts. Uh, basically all lowercase, uh, you know, um, I, there's a maximum of 64 characters. I think, uh, for the account name, a minimum of two characters, something like that. And the top level names are, are not available yet. On mainnet, it's .near. On testnet, it's .testnet. Uh, and then maybe later this year, I imagine, we'll, we'll auction off those top level uh, domain names. Implicit accounts are also supported. That's very similar to Ethereum uh, account names, but basically that's like a temporary account that you can then send uh, money to to get um, a full account if you want to convert it into a full account. Um, 
Okay, so uh, you pay for data with storage staking. If you look at your wallet, you'll basically see this amount that's reserved for storage. I mentioned that earlier. Not, not much else there. We have these two keys, function call access and full access keys. And uh, you can see them here. The full access key is basically you know, a, a public private key pair. There's a nonce, how many times you've used it. So we can make sure that transactions uh, that are signed are, are unique because the nonce increments per transaction. And the permission is full access and that's the definition of full access. You do anything you want with the account. With function call access, there's a little bit more detail there. We track the nonce also, but we also track the allowance. So there's a, an upper limit of how much money this key can spend on the account that it's attached to. There's a receiver ID. It could be the same account or it could be another account, meaning I can give you a key that lets you spend my money from my account to call another contract. And that's a you know great for like onboarding users, for example, if you want to give them a, a trial, you know, freemium service. Here's you know uh, ten uh, calls or ten uses of the service. You can put the allowance there. Uh, and there's currently a proposal to actually change it from allowance to like number of uses. Uh, and so in, in the end, that that's that's the idea. And then the method names is an array of what methods you can call on the receiver, whether it's the account that the key's on or some other account. Uh, if it's an empty array, you can call any methods on the receiver account. And again, here account contract. It's kind of the same thing because if you have an account and you deploy a contract to it then that that becomes your contract uh, and so you can think of these as like there's there's several things you can do in terms of the primitive actions that you do with near function call access uh, keys let you do this one thing full access keys let you do all of them so you can manipulate identity, money, and code with identity, create account, delete account, add key, delete key, with money, transfer, and stake, with code, deploy contract, and a function call. But a function call access key just lets you do this one thing, function call. Full access key lets you do all of them. Uh, and then, of course, um, accounts live on one and only one shard. You can't determine which shard. Uh, mainnet is currently on one shard. Uh, but we, we do have um, uh, a guild that's testing with multiple shards uh, at the moment, and we're, we're planning to release multiple shards, I, I think, later this year. Um, and so anytime you make a cross-contract call, you, the call moves through the same machinery as if it was going to another shard. Even if it comes back to your own account or to another account on the same shard, you still go through the same machinery. And so the assumption is made, it's a simplifying assumption, that any time you call another contract, it's a cross-contract call. This is what it looks like. Here's some code in assembly script. This is a two functions, payout and on payout complete. And you can see here that uh, this particular lottery, if there is a winner, uh, contract promise batch um, you know, is created, this promise, and we transfer the pot to that winner. That's what that arrow is pointing at, the transfer. And then we call, so promise.then on the context contract name ourselves, we make this fun function call on payout complete, which is right below the second arrow. And that's where we let ourselves know, hey, uh, you know, the, the game is over. We just paid this, you know, paid out the pot. Somebody won. Okay, we can just confirm that transactions happen. So this is the transfer and this is the callback. These are asynchronous calls. So let's talk about languages briefly. Assembly script and Rust contracts. So pros. Assembly script, easier for prototyping. You'll learn it super quick if you know JavaScript and, and type or TypeScript. The binaries are smaller and you can actually read uh, the, the web assembly as text that's generated much easier than the Rust because the, the tool chain in, in Rust is, is pretty uh, mature, pretty thick. And so the WASM that it produces is hard to read in, in the web assembly as text format. But with Rust, the pros are that it's a mature battle-hardened compiler. It's been around for a long time. It's actually the most mature uh, tool chain in the industry to go from a programming language to web assembly. Um, thriving ecosystem, lots of use cases. Uh, and, and the SDK that we give you makes life uh, pretty easy. It's similar to the SDK we give you for assembly script. Uh, but in Rust, it makes a big difference. Um, and then um, the cons are this you know, immature compiler on the assembly script side, debugging tools are immature mature on Rust. It's a steep learning curve. That's a con. And, and even experts sometimes will fight the compiler in Rust. So uh, yeah, that's right, Mariano. Near is just one shard on mainnet. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then um, the uh, assembly script uh, uh, contract uh, data and Rust contract data. Here's an example with a posted message. So you see this, you know, class on the uh, assembly script, a struct on uh, the Rust side with a, a new method to instantiate new ones. You can see some of the uh, stuff that we're doing there, like uh, checking to see if the attached deposit is over some amount. That makes it a premium message. Um, and, and this is from the guest book. And then we capture who the sender is uh, or the signer account ID in Rust, but quite similar actually. And then the behavior, you see two methods here, add message and get messages. And on the right-hand side, add message, get messages. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, basically the interface uh, for the contract. Right, so the, it's not not too different. You can see quite a, quite a lot of similarities here between these two. No matter what, you're generating a WASM file, and this is actually the WebAssembly's text. And you can see the get messages and add messages here. This is add message from the assembly script. It's very easy to read. Uh, you can actually follow the code line by line and see how we're kind of you know pushing and popping uh, you know to the stack there. And then, um, uh, uh, you know, that this means that no matter whether you write an assembly script or Rust, you get the same, you know, uh, type of thing at the end, the WASM file that you can then simulate locally, and then you deploy it. Okay, any questions, any comments? So just a reminder, this is what you can do. At this point, you can go through this figment learn pathway, super quick, apply for a bounty, grant, open web collective. We also have a near certified developer course. I'd be happy to share that link for you if you wanna apply. It's a week long part-time course. If you're familiar with web development, you could probably knock the whole thing out in a day. Uh, sorry, with uh, Ethereum development. If you're a web developer with some experience, uh, yeah, happy to, Darnell. Uh, if you're a web developer with some experience, probably take you a, a few hours a day, four to six hours a day if you're new to blockchain, um, maybe more depending on how deep you want to go. And you, you'll probably spend a few days on it. If, if, you're, if you're a junior dev, maybe you've graduated a boot camp or you've been developing for less than a couple of years, you'll probably spend four to six hours a day and you'll want to spend the whole week on it. Uh, so that there's a lot of material in the course. Happy to share it with you. Happy to share the application. Um, you know, apply uh, the apply now if you want to submit your application. Uh, and we we actually pay you to take the course, which is pretty amazing. Uh, that you know, usually people pay to learn, but but in this blockchain space, it's sort of bizarro land uh, where where people are paying you to, to learn because I think everybody recognizes that there's so many things to learn uh, that uh, we you know it's really a kind of a learner's market at this point. Uh, if if we want yeah if if we want developers to pay attention to us, we're going to have to attract them not only with good content and with uh, you know uh, interesting work and and and. A, you know, great job and, and, and business and innovation opportunities, but, but also we need to sweeten the pot and pay you for your time. I, I love it as a, as a, you know, a lifelong learner and as a teacher, I think it's awesome. Uh, so anyway, th this is what you can do right now. I'll share the, uh, the course application. Okay. Any, um, any uh, qu uh, questions at this point? Yep. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sherry, for the, for the presentation. Mm, sure. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. So I just, I just had a question as in like, it's, it's a sort of a, uh, you know, because all these developers are going to go uh, and develop in 10 days. Um, what, and I mean, they, they're just going to start from scratch and some of the developers don't have, might not have blockchain background also. So do you have any uh, like uh, special like advice for them? How should they, uh, you know, go about it? If they start, if they, if they are, you know, looking at near and start start to build on near uh, in these ten days, span of time, short span of time. Yeah, I mean the 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 fastest way to get started building on near is to check out, uh, you know, near dot org um, slash learn, where we have a list of workshops that are just always on. Um, source code workshops, uh, you know, guided, um, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, examples that you can move through, uh, and also some high-level summary stuff. You can take a look at, at some of the things that are deployed uh, on uh, on near right now. So um, th this is kind of the, the fastest self-service way to do this. Uh, but you can uh, you can also uh, check out um, the uh, near certified. Uh, developer a course, and I, I think uh, what I can do is 
share. And I just need to turn off a couple of links uh, here. Um, yeah. Okay, so you can check out that. Um, you can check out that work. And, and this is basically, this is the whole course. So if anybody's curious, um, <laughs> nice. I, so I don't know, uh, Dirty Camel is asking uh, uh, if this presentation will be available as a recorded video on demand. Um, I, ho I hope your dinner was yes. good. Um, so I imagine it will be, right? We just yes. recorded it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so uh, so anyway, so so these two things, near.org slash learn, and then the uh, near certified developer course, and I just turned off the links to join our Discord and add availability because the course is literally running right now. Uh, you know, this is day two, so uh, you can join the next one. Um, you know, it, it'll happen in uh, in a couple of weeks from now by applying at the link just above that at learnnear.club. Uh, that that's the top link there. But all the content is here. If you want to start learning on your own, uh, you can see what we're doing, how we're doing it. You're, you're more than welcome to kind of go through it at your own pace, watch recordings and all that sort of stuff. No big deal at all. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Sharif. And if uh, developers have some questions, I can uh, like, where, where's the best way to, you know, reach out to get help? Uh, yeah, the, the absolute best way, I think I pasted it earlier, is the near.chat. So, okay. Um, this is this is our Discord server, our, our main Discord server. Um, uh, it's it's not the one that we're using for the near certified developer. That, that's the difference. Uh, but uh, but yeah, there's a thousand people in there, um, and it's it's actually quite active. Uh, so yeah, for sure, feel free to come in there, ask questions. Um, you, you'll you know if you you're happy to help if you if you ping me and just remind me that we met at, at Unblock 2021. No problem at all. Perfect. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you so yeah. much for taking sure. out the time. Yeah, really my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Good luck. Have fun. Yeah. Yeah.